continuing in our series, cover to cover, Jesus in all of the Bible. And uh, today we're in the installment number 15 in that series that is going to be talking about Jesus in the prophets. And uh, we're going to be looking at not all, but many of the Old Testament prophets. And in their teachings and in their lives, we're going to see reflections of Christ. And the reason I'm so interested in this series is I think the power is all in the Word. And the more faith and confidence you have in the Bible and, and that this is a supernatural message from God to us that uh, will take every word, you know, we're to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It'll increase your confidence in the power of the Bible. Well, I started to tell you that I, I ran into an amazing fact this week, and it's about Naya's skeleton. Back in 2007, some archaeologists had learned that cave divers in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico had run across uh, this underwater cave, very cold water, uh, very deep. They call it, I think it's Hoyo Negro, which means black hole. And uh, they found a human skeleton along with some animal bones and things. And, and the skeleton they discovered was of a girl that was between 15 and 17. They gave her the name Naya. And um, it was the most perfectly preserved because the, the water there is so cold and it was so depleted of oxygen, the things necessary to break down the bones, it was preserved and it was complete and it gave wonderful DNA samples. And from that skeleton that they believe is thousands of years old, they were able to learn so many things about the Paleo-Americans that uh, came across, they believe, the Bering Strait. You know, DNA science is fascinating. Um, they're learning so much about just the migration of humanity through history. Now, I disagree with some of their timetables, but one thing I think is interesting, uh, DNA specialists say they pretty much decided that every person in the world today comes from two original people. Wow. That's just, that's shocking. Of course, it's in the Bible. And they also say as we track the migration of man around the planet, it seems like the cradle of civilization has either come from North Africa or Mesopotamia, which is, of course, where they would have come from Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel. Isn't that fascinating? The, the thing about Nai's, Nai's skeleton that I thought was interesting is doing the, the DNA studies, they believe most of the people in North America are most closely related with the people of Mongolia, based on DNA, the DNA similarities, and that they believe it only took 100 people to go across the Bering Strait not too long after the flood. The water levels were lower. They were able to just walk across. They made their way down into these two continents of North and South America. And some experts in population growth said 100 people under normal conditions over a thousand years, that's taking into account sickness and war and predators, a lifespan of about 45, 50 years back then, would turn into three billion people in 1,000 years. 100 people. Isn't that amazing? So how many people were there in the world before the flood with Adam and Eve living 900 years and having many sons and daughters? Could have been a lot of people back then. I just thought that you'd find that interesting. But uh, the reason I share that with you is there is a spiritual DNA that you find in the Bible. You know, I, I, I printed this out today. You won't be able to see it. But for Christmas or birthday, I don't remember what it was, one of our kids bought me a DNA study. I wondered if they wondered if I was really their father. But... Uh, <laughs> It turned out I was, and they were trying to disown me. But uh, it, the funny thing about it is I got this DNA study from Ancestry.com, and um, all of my life, my father and my uncles all said, yeah, we're part Cherokee. And yeah, my grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee, and 
And I just always heard it, always told everybody. I had some friends that nicknamed me Indian, and I thought that was really cool. They did the DNA study. I've got no Indian in me at all, zero. I look for 1% somewhere. Turns out I have 1% of India from India. <laughs> so somewhere someone got that mixed up. Most of it is Jewish from uh, Europe. As, you know, I already knew that. And then I'm a mutt, you know, Scandinavia, Great Britain. I like telling people about my ancestry, but I find people will be polite, but most people really don't care about that. <laughs> they care about their ancestry. So I'm going to talk to you about your ancestry. We are all related to Christ because we're adopted into the family. But when you look at the Old Testament prophets, you can see in the lives and the teachings of the prophets the DNA of Jesus. And we're going to go through some, not all, about 10 of the prophets in the Bible, and I think you'll find this is true. Now, we left off in our last study talking about Jesus in the life and story of David, King David, right? Some of you remember. Um, now we're going to go to Solomon. And you said, Pastor Doug, I thought we we're going to talk about the prophets. Solomon was a prophet, the son of David. He wrote three books in the Bible. Most of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs the Song of Solomon in Ecclesiastes. Solomon is like Jesus in that, first of all, he's the son of David. And uh, Jesus, what was one of the titles for Jesus? Son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Son of David, have mercy on me. There were many Old Testament prophets that said that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. And they called him the son of David. And he would be another ruler in Israel. He would be a king. The other thing about Solomon that is uh, clear to see a picture or a reflection of Jesus in that he is the most glorious king. He was a king of glory. Even Jesus describing Solomon, he said, this is Luke 12, 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon was the richest king. And when you get to glory, you'll see there is no one richer than King Jesus. When you have golden streets, during the time of Solomon, it said there was so much gold in the kingdom, silver was counted as nothing. It was a glorious golden age. It was actually the pinnacle. It was the climax of the, the zenith of the glory of Israel was during the time of Solomon. Solomon is not only known for his glory, he had a great throne. It describes his throne and it also tells us that he was a wise judge. Jesus is our judge. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our prophet. Like Solomon, Jesus is the son of David. And the other interesting thing about Solomon, it tells us that he built the house of the Lord. He built a beautiful, glorious house of the Lord. Now there is a prophecy you'll find in 2 Samuel chapter 7. You may want to go there. And you can always read a little before and a little after, but I just want to share verses 12 and 13. David is sitting in his house. Hiram, the king of Tyre, had helped David build a palace after he became king, and he's in, looking around at the wonderful, it's a long way from the tent he lived in when he was a shepherd in Bethlehem, and he's thinking about how God has blessed him. And then he looks out the window, and he sees that the ark of God is in a tent. And he said, this isn't right. The ark of the God of heaven is in a tent, and I'm in a palace. And right while he's thinking these things, Nathan the prophet walks in, and David says to Nathan, yeah, I want to build a temple for God's glory. Nathan says, do all that is in your heart. But then the word of the Lord comes to Nathan and says, no, no, Nathan, you spoke too soon. Go back and tell David, you're not to build a house for me. It's good that you had this in your mind to do it, but... Uh, you are a man of war, a man of blood, and you've also shed innocent blood with, you know, the Bathsheba Uriah incident. He said, you'll not build the house for me. Your son will build me a house. Now, this is where the prophecy comes in. Verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house from my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, is this a prophecy talking about Solomon or Jesus or both? 
It's what you would call, I think, a dual prophecy in the Bible. Clearly, Solomon, the son of David, built a house. He's the one who built the temple. But Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will make one without hands. Jesus was a carpenter. He built a house. You and I are the temple of God. Amen? That Jesus built. We are part of the body of Christ. We are living stones, the Bible says, in the temple of God. So Solomon is a type of Jesus. He's also known not only as a judge, he's a wise and a merciful judge. When everybody else was confounded about that case with the two women, both claiming to know that that the baby was their baby, Solomon was able to determine who was the true mother and who was the one lying. So he was a, a wise judge. So Solomon, can you see it, friends? He was a type of Jesus and the glory of Solomon. The the Gentiles came seeking the wisdom of Solomon. You remember when Jesus was alive, the Greeks, they came to uh, Andrew and Philip and they said, we would see Jesus. Even the Gentiles wanted to see him because they had heard of his wisdom. People came from trying to arrest Jesus and they said, why haven't you arrested him? And they said, no man ever spoke like this man. And so Christ had that, that wisdom And he had that um, power. You look in Matthew 12, verse 42. Jesus is speaking. He said, the queen of the south, he's talking about the queen of Sheba, she will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And a greater than Solomon is here. Even Jesus compares himself with Solomon. He is the son of David. All right, moving on, because we've got several to go. We see Jesus in Elijah. Now, there's no book of Elijah in the Bible. Elijah didn't write a book. He did write a couple of letters that are referenced. But how do we see Jesus in the story of Elijah? Elijah is this great prophet. And for one thing, how long did Jesus minister? Three and a half years. We all know that. From the time of his baptism until the crucifixion, three and a half years. In the story of Elijah, it begins with a three and a half year time period where he's being persecuted. Was Jesus persecuted during his ministry? And then there's this great sacrifice on Mount Carmel. And after this sacrifice, the rain comes. Jesus, three and a half years after he begins his ministry, there is a great sacrifice on Mount Calvary. And because he gives his life, he sends the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the story of Elijah that after that sacrifice, there was a great darkness that covered the land. And when Jesus died on the cross, there was great darkness that covered the land. Elijah, during the famine, he works a miracle. Now, everybody's starving, but Elijah has bread. Jesus has the bread of life. And Elijah provides bread for this widow he stays with. A woman is a symbol of what? Of a church. And does Jesus feed his church in the wilderness? In Revelation, do you read about a woman fleeing into the wilderness for three and a half years, 1,260 days, and God feeds her? And so you have this same allegory there as well. And he works a miracle in that he resurrects a boy There is the resurrection of a beloved son in the story of Elijah. Do you see the story of Jesus there? It also tells us then he has to flee after the showdown on Mount Carmel. Elijah has to flee into the wilderness and he is fed with this bread of heaven and in the strength of that bread he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. There's only three people in the Bible that fast 40 days and 40 nights. That's Moses, Elijah, in Jesus. So he's a type of Jesus here. You can see the DNA of Jesus in the story of Elijah. And then, of course, and I think this is one of the most vivid examples, not too many people ascend to heaven with others watching. Enoch went to heaven, but he just disappeared. He was not. But Elijah said to Elisha, if you see me when I am taken up from you, the apostle saw Jesus ascend to heaven. And Elijah, before he ascends to heaven, he goes and he visits the different schools of the prophets to encourage them. This is 2 Kings chapter 2. And then he tells Elisha, if you see me when I am taken up, I will give you a double portion of my spirit. Jesus ascends to heaven. He says, wait in Jerusalem and you will receive the promise of the Father. And he sends the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So Elijah ascends. He leaves a robe behind. Jesus leaves his robe of righteousness. 
and he sends the Holy Spirit. By the way, has the Lord ever revoked his promise to send the Spirit? No. Jesus said he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He will send it to us when we believe. So we see Jesus in the story. By the way, how did Elisha receive the Holy Spirit from Elijah? He asked. Elijah says to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. What do we do to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Ask ye of the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign. We don't ask enough for the Holy Spirit. It's the most important thing you can ask for because you might be missing a lot of things, but if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't go to heaven. You must have the Spirit of God. So Elijah is a type of Jesus. Now, the apprentice of Elijah was someone with a similar name. It's Elisha. And Elisha, he asks for a double portion of the Holy Spirit. He receives this. He crosses the Jordan River, and he begins his ministry out of coming, after coming out of the Jordan River. When does Jesus begin his ministry? After baptism. So I see Jesus in the story of Elisha. It tells us that he instructs others to be baptized in the Jordan. You remember when Naaman wanted cleansing? Uh, by the way, the Jewish writings say that Elijah performed eight miracles, and according to their reckoning, Elisha performed 16, which is twice as many, and there you've got your double portion. Isn't that interesting? I have not counted myself, but it's... Uh, I'll take their word for it. So Naaman comes and he's told to wash in the Jordan River seven times, that being a symbol of baptism because that's where Jesus begins his ministry and John the Baptist begins his ministry and Jesus is announced and introduced there at the Jordan in the context of baptism and the Gospels begin, you know, at least the Gospel of Mark and John with baptism and the Gospels end by Jesus saying, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Elisha sends people to the Jordan to be washed. Elisha also performs a resurrection. He raises the beloved and only son of the Shunammite woman and her husband, that boy who dies working in the field with his father, who is a type of Christ. But there you have a resurrection again. That doesn't happen that often. It must be a type of Christ. And then there's uh, an interesting story at the end of Elisha's life. It says when Elisha dies and he's buried, the Moabite raiders were going through the land and the men of Israel needed to perform a funeral. And they're carrying the body of this other man out. It's not Elisha. And they see the Moabite raiders going through the country and they don't have time to finish the service. They think we've got to do something with his body and run for our lives. They say, well, here's the tomb of Elisha. They're somewhere in Israel. And they take the lid off the tomb and they drop this body in. And the Bible says they, the dead body touches the bones of Elisha and comes back to life. That doesn't happen every day. In his death, Elisha gives life. It's even through the death of Christ that we find new life. It says the man stood upon his feet. Something else about Elisha, he multiplies bread. And you can read this one in 2 Kings chapter 4. It says, there came a man from Baal Shalisha, and he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves. Now, these loaves are not like the great big French loaves of bread. They're little tortillas, little japati. He brought him 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he, Elisha, said, give it to the people that they might eat. But his servant said, what? Shall I set this before a hundred men? That'd be an insult. This, this is not nearly enough to feed them. And again, Elisha said, give it to the people that they might eat. For thus says the Lord, they will eat and have some left over. And he set it before them and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord by the man of God. So Elisha multiplies the bread and there are leftovers. Does that sound familiar? Do you see the DNA of Jesus in that story? Did Jesus multiply bread? Not only does Elisha multiply bread, he multiplies oil. You remember this woman, and this is also in the same chapter, 2 Kings chapter 4, a woman comes to Elisha and she says, Sir, I don't know what to do. 
our family's in debt. My husband died. He borrowed money from the creditors to, you know, plant some seed in his rented property. We can't pay for it. The creditors come. He's taken everything from us. He's coming next time to take my sons as his slaves. They could do that back in Bible times. If you couldn't pay your debts, you had to pay, you know, you'd be freed during the Jubilee, but you had to serve, if you were Hebrew, at least six years. She said, my sons are going to be taken as slaves. What do I do? Elisha said, what do you have? She said, well, all I've got left is a little oil in a vase. He said, go borrow as many vessels as you can from your neighbors, not a few. Fill your house with them, bring your sons in, shut the door and pour the oil from the little vial into the other jars. She does that and this little jar keeps pouring and pouring and the oil keeps coming. As long as there's an empty vessel, the oil fills the vessels. And what does oil represent? It's the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit does not fill full vessels. If you're full of something else, he's not going to fill you. Yeah, you got to empty yourself before the Lord, right? And he multiplies the oil and she says, what do I do now? He says, sell that and you will pay your debt and you will have a surplus and live on that. So again, there's this miracle of the multiplication and then a surplus. I see Jesus in the story of Elisha. What about the story of Jonah? Wow. I don't have time to read those four chapters, but I'm hoping you know the story of Jonah. Look at some of the similarities. Now, it's not like Jesus that Jonah ran from the word of the Lord, but this is where the allegory begins. Jonah gets in the boat. It says he's asleep in the lowest part of a ship during a storm. Did Jesus sleep in the stern of a boat during a storm? The Bible says the captain comes to Jonah and says, Arise, O sleeper, and call on your God that we may not perish. The disciples shake Jesus awake and say, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? The Bible says Jonah goes up on the deck and they cast lots. Did they cast lots at the cross? And then Jonah offers himself as a sacrifice. He says, it's my fault. Throw me over. Well, they don't want to do it. They try and save themselves, but there's no other way. So they throw Jonah overboard and they finally have peace when Jonah dies. Now, I don't know if you've noticed on each of these slides, I'm giving you the date at the top. So you got Solomon about 930 B.C., Elijah 875, Elisha 825, Jonah 790. Jonah is mentioned other places in the Bible. It's a true story. He's a prophet in the northern kingdom. By the way, we don't have to guess if Jonah is a type of Christ. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, you look in verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then Jesus talks about as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And the heart of the earth is not just talking about the tomb. It's talking about the sufferings of Christ that began Thursday night. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. He was paying for the penalty of sin. Jo Jonah is a type of Christ. They throw Jonah overboard and what happens to the storm? Calm. When Jesus speaks, what happens to the storm? Miraculously calmed in both stories. Jonah comes out of the whale. Jonah suffers terribly in the whale, I'm quite certain. If you don't think so, try it yourself and let me know how that goes. Did you, did you hear last week or two weeks ago? It's actually, there's a video. Some whale watchers, two people in a kayak up in Alaska, I think, got swallowed by a whale. They spit them out right away because it wasn't what the whale wanted either. But they survived. A few bruises. All right. Three days. You get the three days in Jonah, the three days in Jesus. And then what does Jonah do? He takes the message of repentance to the Gentiles. Where does the message of Jesus go? Not only to the Jews, but then it spreads like fire through the Gentiles and there's a great revival. And then Here's the, one of the most important things people miss. Jesus said no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. In Luke he says, well in Matthew he says three days and three nights. In Luke he doesn't mention the three days and three nights. Jesus says as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. What does that mean? 
The Bible says Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. How many days? It says he entered the city a day's journey. And the phrase there is talking about the daylight part of a day. That's 12 hours. Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in a day? So that's three and a half days. Then what does Jonah preach? 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. So you get three and a half, then you get 40. Jesus preached three and a half years, and then he said, this generation will not pass away before there's not one stone left upon another in the temple, and judgment would come. The Ninevites were spared because they repented. Christ's nation did not repent, and judgment came. He said, Jonah is a sign to this generation. Got that? Three and a half, three and a half. Jesus can be seen in the story of Jonah. Yes. Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, we don't know much about his personal life, but certainly in his teachings, we see Jesus. I'll quickly go through this. Zechariah, he lived about 760 B.C. That's 760 years before Christ. You already see the glimmers and reflections of Jesus. Look in Zechariah 6, verse 12. Then speak to him, saying, this is a prophecy, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. Jesus is called the branch or the rod that would come. He'd sprout from the branch of Jesse. From his place he shall branch out. He will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the glory. He will sit and rule on his throne. He shall be a priest on his throne. Now a throne is usually a king, but this is a king priest who is called the stem, the branch on the throne. And the counsel of peace shall be between them both. Look in Zechariah 12.10. And I'll pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. Talks about the beloved son who is pierced. Can that be missed? Do we see the story of Jesus in Zechariah? And I could talk about Haggai. It's not in my notes, but Haggai talked about building the temple of the Lord. Put God's house ahead of your own house, and he will bless you. And then I could talk about Jesus where it says in Malachi, you're blessed, O Bethlehem. Unto, out of you will he come forth to me who is to be ruler in Israel. I mean, there's so many of the Old Testament prophets that talk about Jesus. Jesus in the story of Hosea. And he lived about 750 B.C. Hosea is given an odd job for a prophet. He's told to go marry a prostitute. Normally, that's not what the conference asks their pastors to do. But God is trying to illustrate that though his people have been unfaithful and played the harlot with other gods, he still loves. And he's calling for repentance. And even after he marries her and has children with her, she then wanders again and he redeems her. Hosea 2.20, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. So Hosea has an unfaithful wife, but he loves her. He redeems her. He calls people to turn from their sins. Jesus calls himself the bridegroom of God's people. Matthew 9.15, and there's several parables about the wedding feast. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. Does Jesus compare his relationship with the church to a marriage and a wedding? Look in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Who is the wife? The bride of Christ. It's the church. Who, though she was once unfaithful like Mary Magdalene, is made pure through Jesus. Hosea 6, verse 1 and 2. Come and let us return to the Lord for he is torn, but he will heal us. He's stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we might live in his sight. After the third day, he will raise us. Does that sound familiar? A resurrection after the third day. All right, let's jump to Isaiah. Now, Isaiah's got the whole gospel in his book. I don't have time to read 66 chapters, uh, but many of these you know. First of all, Isaiah is a priest and a prophet like Jesus who dies a martyr's death at the hands of his own leader, which is what happened to Jesus. Isaiah sees God. He comes from a vision of God 
from the presence of God in the temple, if you read in Isaiah 6, and he delivers a message from God. Jesus has come from the right hand of the Father. Just read, for example, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called, you know this, you sung the Messiah, <laughs> Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These are all titles that we know belong to the Messiah. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom mine soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And then I dare you to read Isaiah chapter 53, the whole chapter. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It says he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. All through the book of Isaiah and especially chapter 53 talks about the suffering of the servant, the Messiah, the Christ. And then we see Jesus in the story of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, about 600 B.C., he is a, uh, a prophet who's given a message to deliver hope as well as impending judgment if there's not repentance. He lives during a time of political upheaval and unrest. He's misunderstood and persecuted by the state and the citizens of his own hometown, like Jesus. You know, the people in Nazareth wanted to throw Jesus off a cliff. I don't know if you remember that. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. There's three times in the Bible we see Jesus weeping there at the tomb of Lazarus. We see him weeping over Jerusalem, and he's weeping in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, it doesn't use the word weeping or crying in the Gospels, but in Hebrews where it refers to it, in Hebrews chapter 5, it says, with tears and crying, describing his Gethsemane experience. Of course, he's perspiring blood, so it shouldn't surprise us he was crying. So he's called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Jeremiah wrote a whole book called Lamentations, uh, talking about the sorrow of what sin has done. But, and Jeremiah, do you know his own people? He is uh, kind of sold into Egypt because of persecution. Jesus flees to Egypt because of persecution in his own land. Jeremiah is falsely accused, arrested, and unjustly beaten as Jesus was. Then I'll conclude with Daniel, a great prophet Daniel. And again, this is not comprehensive. You know, there's a website you can go to, NASA, and you can type in NASA, don't do it right now, International Space Station, and you can see what is, you can see the world from the cameras on the International Space Station. You can see exactly, I looked last night just to check, and it was over Texas, and it's, it's always going around the world. So we're giving you not the 30,000 foot view, we're giving you the 225 mile view. I guess the space station is 250 miles above the Earth. So we're doing a flyover, and I hope you're seeing Jesus in these prophets of the Old Testament. But look at Daniel. Now, I, I'm not going to take everything in Daniel. Just look at Daniel 6, because I think all the kids know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Look at what happens here. The other leaders around Daniel are jealous because the king is thinking to set him over the whole realm. The Bible says the religious leaders handed him over to Pilate because of jealousy. It says he is a righteous man, a godly man, a faultless man, a wise man. People are spying on him and following him around, trying to find fault with him. But it says they could find no fault in him. What did Pilate say about Jesus? I find no fault in him. He goes to the lion's den after an episode. You know, he's not told the, there's a law made. He's not supposed to be caught praying in public. He goes to the lion den after an episode of praying. It says three times a day, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays three times and then he goes to the cross. It tells us that uh, Pilate wanted to deliver Jesus. King Darius sought till the going down of the sun to deliver Daniel. He did not want to do it, but he was forced into it by others as Pilate was. So Daniel is taken and he's thrown in the lion's den. Bible tells us the devil goes around as a roaring lion, but you can read in the Old Testament that you will have victory over the lion and the serpent, the lion being a symbol of the devil there as well. 
A stone is placed over the mouth of the den and the government seal is placed on it. A stone is placed on the tomb with the seal of the government. And the Bible tells us that the king goes and he passes the night in fasting. Um, I'm sure the angels hung up their harps in heaven when Jesus was on the cross and in the tomb. Then very early in the morning, the king comes back to the lion's den. What time of day does Jesus rise? Very early in the morning. Oh, by just a footnote, uh, Daniel was never married. Uh, Jesus was never married. Daniel's bride was the church. His intercession was for his people. And Jesus married the church. His intercession is for you and me. Early in the morning, the king comes to the den, and lo and behold, they move the stone, and he is alive. And they move the stone. The women come early in the morning, and the angels say, he is alive. It's, you see the story of Jesus, friends, in the story of Daniel? And then the king makes a decree that those who did this to Daniel, they go to the lion's den. Daniel comes out. They are humbled. He is exalted. That's what's going to happen in the great judgment. And the king sends a decree to the whole world about this miracle and the God of Daniel. Because of the resurrection, the message of Jesus goes to the world. And the king, of course, is the king of Persia, so it's going to a Gentile world because of what uh, Daniel stood up for the law of God. He would not disobe disobey the law of God even if it was one commandment and because of that the message goes to the world. That's a lesson for Seventh-day Adventists to be faithful about all the commandments. Amen? Amen? And because of that faithfulness in the last days we're going to see the message go to the world. Well, friends, I hope that you're encouraged by this. I see Jesus in these stories. You know, typically today, if a family adopts a child, that child is not going to have their DNA. But when you accept Jesus, you then receive the spiritual DNA of your new family. You can kind of read about this in Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You are, God becomes your true father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You are genuine, 100% children of God. You end up carrying, if you could do an angelic blood test, the DNA of God's Son would be found in us because we have been created in his image. Is that right? Through salvation, we are recreated in his image. And if children, then heirs of Christ and joint heirs with Christ. That's wonderful to be part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. And we, we can see the story of Jesus all through these Old Testament prophets. And I'm not quite done with the series. I've got two, maybe three more presentations, and, and then uh, we'll bring this to a conclusion. But I just wanted to encourage us all to know that the Jesus, the whole book's about Jesus. He said, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If you would know the Lord, and you must know the Lord, best place to know him is through his word. Amen. <laughs>